seated, and Mary is at his feet, looking up adoringly in his face. As the tension relaxes, she speaks with a smile. I want you to tell me. Every woman likes to know. When was the first time you thought me nicer than the others? I think a year ago. We were chasing goats on the big slopes, and you outdistanced us all. You were the first of our party to run a goat down. I was proud of you that day. Oh, Gov, I only did it to please you. Everything I have done has been out of the desire to please you. If I thought that in taking a wife from Manos, you were imperiling your dignity. Have no fear of that, dear. I have thought it all out. The wife, Polly, always takes the same position as the husband. But I am so unworthy. It was sufficient to me that I should be allowed to wait on you at that table. You shall wait on me no longer. At whatever table I sit, Polly, you shall soon sit there also. Come, let us try what it will be like. As your servant at your feet. No, as my consort by my side. They are sitting thus when the hatch is again opened and coffee offered. But Mary is no longer there to receive it. Her sisters peep through in consternation. In vain they rattle the cup and saucer. Agatha brings the coffee to Crichton, who forgets for the moment that it is not a month hence. Help your mistress first, girl. Three women are bereft of speech, but he does not notice it. He addresses Catherine vaguely. Are you a good girl, Kitty? I try to be, go. That's right. He takes command of himself again and signs to them to sit down. Ernest comes in cheerily, but finding Crichton here is suddenly weak. He subsides on a chair, wondering what has happened. Ernest, you are becoming a little slovenly in your dress. I don't like it. Thank you. Ernest, having risen, sits again. Daddy and Traherne arrive. Daddy, I want you. Is it because I forgot to clean up the dam? No, no. Crichton pours some wine into a goblet. A glass of wine with you, Daddy. Uh, your health, God. He is about to drink, but the master checks him. And hers. Daddy, this lady has done me the honor to promise to be my wife. Polly? I ought first to have asked your consent. I deeply regret, but nature, may I hope I have your approval. May you, Gov? Rather. Oh, Polly! He puts his proud arms around her. We all congratulate you, Gov, most heartily. Long life to you both, sir. There is much shaking of hands, all of which is sincere. When will it be, Gov? Crichton turns to Mary, who whispers to him. As soon as the brightest skirt can be prepared. His manner has been most indulgent and without the slightest suggestion of patronage, but he knows it is best for all that he should keep his place and that his presence hampers them. My friends, I thank you for your good wishes. I thank you all. And now, perhaps you would like me to leave you to yourselves. Be joyous. Let there be song and dance tonight. Polly, I shall take my coffee in the parlor. You understand. He retires with pleasant dignity. Immediately, there is a rush of two girls at Mary. Oh, oh, Father, they are pinching me. Agatha, Catherine, never presume to pinch your sister again. Uh, on the other hand, she may pinch you henceforth as much as ever she chooses. In the meantime, Tweeney is weeping softly, and Catherine and Agatha are not above using her as a weapon. Poor Tweeney. It's a shame. After he had almost promised you. No, he never did. He was always honorable as could be. Twas me as was too vulgar. Don't you dare say a word again, that man. You'll get a lot out of this, Daddy. That's what I was thinking. I dare say I shall have to clean out the dam now. I dare say. Lone's joyful old heart makes him again proclaim that he is a chickity chick. He seizes the concertina. That's the proper spirit. Traherne puts his arm around Catherine, and in another moment they are all dancing to Daddy's music. Never were people happier on an island. A moment's pause is presently created by the return of Crichton, wearing the wonderful robe of which we have already had dark mention. Never has he looked more regal, never perhaps felt so regal. We need not grudge him the one foible of his rule, for it is all coming to an end. No, no. I am delighted to see you all so happy. Go on. You don't like to before you, Gov. It is my wish. The merrymaking is resumed, and soon Crichton himself joins in the dance. It is when the fun is at its fastest and most furious that all stop abruptly as if turned to stone. They have heard the boom of a gun. 
Presently, they are alive again. Ernest leaps to the window. It was a ship's gun. They turn to Crichton for confirmation. Even in that hour, they turn to Crichton. Gulf? Yes. In another moment, Mary and Loam are alone. Father, you heard. Yes, my child. But it was a gun, Father. Yes, a gun. I, I have often heard it. it. It's only a dream, you know. Why don't we go on dancing? Mary takes her father's hands, which have gone cold. Don't you see they have all rushed down to the beach? Come. Rushed down to the beach, yes, yes. Always that. I, I often dream it. Come, father, come. Only a dream, my poor girl. Crichton returns. He is pale but firm. We can see lights within a mile of the shore. Great ship. A ship. Always a ship. Father, this is no dream. It's a dream, isn't it? There's no ship. You are awake, Daddy. And there is a ship. You're, you're not deceiving me. It is the truth. True. A ship? At last? Lone goes after the others, pitifully. There is a small boat between it and the island. They must have sent it ashore for water. Coming in? No. That gun must have been the signal to recall it. It is going back. They can't hear our cries. Going away. So near. So near. I think I'm glad. Have no fear. I shall bring them back. Crichton goes towards the electrical apparatus. Mary stands guard between him and the apparatus. What are you going to do? Fire the beacon. Stop. Don't you see what it means? It means that our life on the island has come to a natural end. Go. Let the ship go. The old man. Saw what it means to him. But I am afraid. Dear Polly. Go. Let the ship go. Mary clings to him, but though it is his death sentence, Crichton loosens her hold. Bill Crichton has got to play the game. He pulls the levers. Soon, through the window, one of the beacons is seen flaring red. There is a long pause. Shouting is heard. Ernest is the first to arrive. Polly! Gov! The boat has turned back. They are English sailors. They have landed. We are rescued. I tell you, rescued. Is there anything to make so great a to-do about? Huh? Have we not been happy here? Happy? Lord, yes. Ernest, we must never forget all that the Gov has done for us. Forget it. The man who could forget it would be a selfish wretch and a... Uh, but I say, this makes a difference. No, it doesn't. A mighty difference. The others come running in, some weeping with joy, others boisterous. We see blue jackets gazing through the window at the curious scene. Lord Loam comes accompanied by a naval officer whom he is continually shaking by the hand. And here, sir, is our little home. <laughs> Let me thank you in the name of us all again and again and again. Very proud, my lord. It is indeed an honor to have been able to assist so distinguished a gentleman as Lord Loam. A glorious, glorious day. I shall show you our other room. Uh, come, my pets. Uh, come, Triton. He is not meant to be cruel. He does not know he has said it. It is the old life that has come back to him. They all leave except Mary, who stretches out her arms to Crichton. Dear Gov, I will never give you up. There is a salt smile on Crichton's face as he shakes his head. He lets his regal cloak slip to the ground. Mary will not take this for an answer. Again her arms go out to him. Then comes the great renunciation. By an effort of will, he ceases to be an erect figure. He has the humble bearing of a servant. His hands come together as if he were washing them. My lady. She goes away. There is none to salute him now, unless we do it. Mm -hmm.